Hello and welcome back to the EtherCAT Communications with Design Drive video series. The previous video in this series provided an overview of the EtherCAT technology and protocol. In this next segment, we'll cover the physical hardware and associated software needed to support the construction of an EtherCAT slave. In addition to the EtherCAT slave controller described in the previous slide, a fully featured EtherCAT slave node is often paired with an MCU to run the slave stack, operate peripherals, and capture inputs. TI has developed a daughter card that, coupled with a C2000 MCU, greatly simplifies the construction of an EtherCAT slave. This figure is a high-level block diagram of the Design Drive Industrial Design Drive Kit, also known as the IDDK. Here you can see the drive circuitry, the C2000 block providing real-time control, and a Citara AM335X providing real-time communication. Today we are introducing the EtherCAT ET1100-enabled daughter card, which enables the C2000 system to handle both functions of real-time control and communication. This diagram shows the typical structure of an EtherCAT slave controller, or ESC. The main functional blocks of an ESC include a dual-ported RAM, DP RAM, that holds the configuration and control registers, user memory, and process data. The EtherCAT master always has read-write access, while access from the slave side, through the PDI, depends on the state machine state. The FMMU, or Field Bus Memory Management Unit, is responsible for converting logical addresses for slave data into physical addresses via an internal table. Addressability is down to the bit level. It's this flexibility that enables a single EtherCAT command to address multiple slaves and achieve very high utilization of available system bandwidth. The sync managers ensure consistent exchange of data between master and slave via a mailbox protocol and they generate interrupts to inform both sides of changes. They use buffers located in the DP RAM memory space for exchanging data. Access to these buffers is controlled by hardware in the sync managers. The process data interface, or PDI, connects the EtherCAT slave controller to the application controller, typically an MCU, which runs the protocol stack. Multiple interface types are supported, including serial, spy, and parallel buses. The distributed clock unit, which provides for the synchronization of a reference clock, typically sourced from the master, and the local clock. The presence of this block enables fine, less than one microsecond control of events and capture data timestamps. The final block is the EEPROM interface to external EEPROMs over I squared C. The information in the external EEPROM is loaded after exiting reset and includes various configuration data, including the slave node vendor, product, revision, and serial numbers, communication default values, and FMMU and sync manager data. The information stored up to word 63, or hex address 3F, is mandatory for slave node operation. Now that we've covered the basic hardware of an EtherCAT slave, in the next section we'll look at the software structure and how this interacts with that hardware. As a reminder, recall that EtherCAT operates at the data link layer in the OSI network model. This layer links layer 1, the physical layer, with the application layer. Though the typical EtherCAT OSI network picture shows layers 3 through 6 as empty, all of the tasks normally associated with these layers do still occur. EtherCAT hardware and software handle all of the tasks, including those listed here, such as link control, normally a transport layer function, management of the Ethernet PHY transceivers, slave node addressing, slave controller configuration, which is stored in the local EEPROM, and finally, sync manager, FMMU, Field Bus Memory Management Unit, Process Data Interface, and Distributed Clocks Configuration. This diagram shows the structure of the software stack that performs the functions just listed in the previous slide. 
The stack is organized into blocks to manage the interface between the ESC hardware and the MCU memory, run the EtherCAT state machine, handle process data, and manage the mailbox and communications protocols. Using the communication profiles, EtherCAT is able to provide an interface to other standards. The profiles include COE, or CAN over EtherCAT, which is the one most commonly used, SOE, or Servo Drive over EtherCAT, EOE, or Ethernet over EtherCAT, which enables EtherCAT to transport standard Ethernet packets in the EtherCAT datagram, and FOE, or File Access over EtherCAT, which finds use in bulk transport such as firmware updates. Note also that any given slave isn't required to support all profiles. Rather, only those needed in a particular slave's application need be included. The slave device description file provided to the EtherCAT master specifies which profiles are available. To understand the operation of the slave stack, it's important to know the operational modes of the slave controller. The EtherCAT state machine controls which functionality is currently available, and that functionality is based on the needs of safely operating a machine in a factory environment, with increasing levels of communications and output capability as we proceed to a fully operational mode. The diagram here shows these states and the allowable transitions between them. A short description of state machine behavior is given here. More details are given in the following slide, which is included for reference. In the init state, no communications on the application layer is possible, and only the master has access to the data link information registers. In the pre-op state, mailbox communication becomes possible, but there is still no process data exchange to the master. This can be thought of as a machine setup state. In the safe op state, communication to the application layer is available, but only inputs are evaluated. Outputs are kept in a safe state. This correlates with the desire to know the state of a factory machine prior to exercising the outputs. In the operational state, all process data inputs and outputs are valid. In a factory, the machine would now be fully operational. A fifth state, bootstrap, is optional, but is recommended if firmware updates are necessary. Note that in operation, the EtherCAT master requests each transition, but the slave must confirm it. These transactions are reflected in the AL control and status registers, respectively. This table shows a more complete listing of behavior and services available in each state of the EtherCAT state machine. As stated before, we won't go into the details here. This is shown only as a reference. In addition to the EtherCAT slave controller described in the previous slide, a fully featured EtherCAT slave node is often paired with an MCU to run the slave stack, operate peripherals, and capture inputs. TI has developed a daughter card that coupled with a C2000 MCU greatly simplifies the construction of an EtherCAT slave. This figure is a high-level block diagram of the Design Drive Industrial Design Drive Kit, also known as the IDDK. Here you can see the drive circuitry, the C2000 block providing real-time control, and a Satara AM335X providing real-time communication. Today we are introducing the EtherCAT ET1100 enabled daughter card, which enables the C2000 system to handle both functions of real-time control and communication. The C2000 EtherCAT daughter card has two physical forms. The first is a control card format with a high density connector that can support a 16-bit asynchronous parallel EMIF interface or a standard SPI serial interface. This daughter card can be connected to an F28377 Delfino control card or an F28377D Delfino dual cord launch pad. The second form is a booster pack format, which can connect to any TI launch pad through a SPI interface only.
Here we see the Beckhoff ET1100 EtherCAT Slave Controller, or ESC, which provides all the hardware packet processing needed to support the EtherCAT protocol. The C2000 EtherCAT daughter card consists of this device, along with two FIs and some simple MUXs, which allow for switching between the SPI and EMIF interfaces. Note that this glue logic isn't needed in an end user application. The ESC can be directly connected to the C2000 MCU in a customer design. This solution provides a low latency interface to the ESC with very low CPU overhead to support EtherCAT communications. The previous slide showed the basic building blocks of an EtherCAT slave. Next, we'll cover the PDI, or Process Data Interface, which is the connection between the EtherCAT slave controller and an MCU. In an EtherCAT system, the ESC is responsible for data link operations such as receiving the EtherCAT frames, parsing them, and passing data through the process data interface, typically referred to as the PDI, to an MCU running the slave stack software. This animation shows the movement of data starting as EtherCAT datagrams sent from the master to each slave in turn. As the data passes through an ESC, New control or output information is sent to the MCU, and new sensor or input information from the MCU is dropped into the passing datagram. In this example, the PDI is exchanging information between the ESC and a C2000 Delfino F2837X MCU. The Beckhoff ET1100 EtherCAT Slave Controller, or ESC, supports two types of interfaces a serial or SPI interface, and an 8 or 16-bit parallel interface, which can have synchronous or asynchronous timing. The TI daughter card supports both types of PDIs through the use of a MUX switch that directs the PDI signals to either the SPI or EMIF external memory interface on the MCU. For the EMIF, only a 16-bit asynchronous interface is supported. Other features, include a buffer to enable a GPIO from the MCU to drive the ESC's reset pin. This enables the ESC to be reset independently from the MCU and allows the slave node to be visible to the EtherCAT master even when the MCU is not operating. A separate regulator is also provided to power the daughter card from a separate 5 volt supply if needed. Next, we will look at the specific pinouts on the F2837X MCUs for the two types of interfaces. The PDI serial connection here is a very common SPI interface with two additional GPIO connections to support an interrupt request, or IRQ, and EEPROM loaded outputs from the ESC. These signals are present in both types of PDIs. Various events in the slave controller can drive the IRQ, including signals from the distributed clock system, changes in the state machine state, and other user-defined interrupt sources. The EEPROM loaded signal is asserted high when the ESC has loaded its configuration information and is ready for communication. This diagram shows the detailed pinout for the 16-bit asynchronous PDI using the MCU's EMIF, or external memory interface. Note that the F28377D has two EMIFs, and either can be used for this interface. The EtherCAT daughter card shown here uses EMIF2. In this example, 13 address bits are used, which is sufficient to cover the entire available memory space of 12 kilobytes which includes 4K registers plus 8 kilobytes of dual-ported RAM on an ET1100 ESC, since each address references a 16-bit word. For the purposes of this reference design, the additional address lines are connected to GPIOs to be used as page selects in addressing upper memory for experimentation. Care should be taken in designing interfaces using the page select method as this will require changes to the EtherCAT slave stack, HAL, or hardware adaptation layer provided by TI.
If emf1 is used on F28377D, no such changes are required. This slide is provided for reference only and shows the timing setting used to connect the F2837X to the ET1100 ESC daughter card. Note that the interface is operating at a very modest speed. To explore the timing options further, please pause the video now and resume when you're ready to move on. More information on TI C2000 EtherCAT solution, TIDM Delfino EtherCAT, can be found at the TI design link given here. Additional details of EtherCAT technology, software, and hardware are available on the ETG and Beckhoff sites. Thanks for watching.